Okay, well, welcome everybody. We are on our six of eight summer lecture series, and um, we will have another one next week, and then a one week break, and then we're going to have a grand finale where Tim and I will present together, and it will be a little bit longer than 20 to 30 minutes, so go ahead and prepare for that. Um, today we're going to talk, tonight we're going to talk about vaping safety. Um, here's just the presentation uh, or the future presentations we're going to do. <clears throat> so next week, Tim is going to talk about the future of fermented cannabinoids, and then we will join each other for um, the research on THC and CBD. Is it the power couple or the odd couple? And draw some conclusions there. Uh, my name is Eloise Thiessen. I am the CEO of Radical Health. I'm joined by um, my colleague and co-owner, Timothy Byers. He's also the president of Radical Health, as well as the program director at Pacific College. And we're really excited to present this um, particular series to you. If you want to know and see more free content, you can go to our website at radicalhealthcare.com and join the Radical community. It is free and you can see uh, past recordings and also get notifications about the things that we're offering in the future, as well as um, access to our YouTube channel where we post all of these when we're done. And if you want even more education and continuing education credits as nurses, um, we do have content that is paid content that you can also find here at radicalhealth.thinkific.com slash collections. And you can get an idea of what those courses are as well. <clears throat> And of course, we just want you to know that today's presentation is not intended to be medical advice. It is for educational purposes only, and the information presented today is not a substitute um, for medical advice. So it's not meant to help in the diagnosis, prognosis, or treatment of any virus, disease, illness, or condition. Okay, so I wanted to present today on um, vaping and vaping safety because I think this is a really hot topic and it's, um, you know, starting at Stanford now and working in a very medicalization model, it's interesting to see um, how people react when you might recommend vaping. And so I want to kind of present today, when would we recommend it? Is it safe? Is it not safe? And during my research, what I thought was really interesting was the vaping history. So vaping was actually invented by Herbert Gilbert. He filed a patent back in 1963 and was awarded it in 1965, but he never commercialized any of his prototypes, which was a smokeless nicotine-free device. He was actually a scrap metal dealer from Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania, who wanted to offer an alternative to smoking. And his device was actually invented a year before the Surgeon General reported the link between smoking cigarettes and lung cancer, as well as other diseases. He believed his device would potentially prevent disease and death associated with tobacco abuse. But no company was willing to mass produce his device. And 55 years later, the e-cigarette industry is worth $10 billion dollars. And Gilbert, actually, his patent expired before he made any money. He's still alive. He was interviewed not too long ago, and he was actually happy that he came up with something that he thinks has helped quite a few people and uh, didn't seem to be bitter about the fact that he missed out on a share of that $10 billion. Okay, so cannabis vaping. There are many cannabis vaping devices out there. They mostly started to emerge in the 1990s. And they can be used for dry herb, concentrates, and extracts, and it's designed to avoid com uh, combustion. Whereas when we smoke cannabis in a joint, in a bong, in a pipe, we are heating that plant material to the point of combustions, which will produce carcinogens and tars. We also have dry herb vapes that are intended to reduce the harshness of smoking that some people might complain of, and also concentrates that can be found in vape cartridges or used as dabs with dab rings. And I'm gonna present some of that here. <clears throat> Vaping defined, it's intended to avoid combustion, heats materials at a lower temperature. Terminology and devices vary. We have no standardization. Cannabis flower vaporizers are handheld or tabletop, and they'll use hot air over milled or ground up cannabis to produce an aerosol. Dabbing oils, wax, shatter, uses a flash vaporization connected to a water pipe, 
And I think one of the most popular methods that I'm going to really focus on is the cannabis e-cigarettes, also known as CEC. It heats concentrated cannabis oil, often distilled in small cartridges with heated coils. And I want to talk a little bit about conduction versus convection, because again, vaporization is designed to avoid combustion. And so you'll see some devices, most devices out there are conduction. It's direct, takes place through that contact with a heat source directly um, from a heating element to the chamber and then goes to the surface of the flower or the concentrate. Convection is indirect, transfers heat from one place to another through the movement of fluid or heated air. And there are some hybrids out there, not many. It's a blend of conduction and convection. It warms the flower or concentrate by warming incoming air and heating the chamber to ensure more thorough vaporization. So what we have here is a portable vaporizer. This is the PAX-3. It's quite popular. It retails for about $250. It's portable, easy to use. You can use it for dry herb or concentrate. It is a conduction heating vape device. Um, some of the drawbacks, of course, are that it's only the app to control the temperature is only available on Android. So with a lot of the vaping devices that I'm going to present today, the goal or the benefit of them is being able to control the temperature because you want to keep the temperature below <clears throat> around below 450 to really prevent combustion. This is the Apollo Air Vape. Um, and this is not an exhaustive list of vapes. I just wanted to present some today so that you can see one, what the price of them, uh, what they tend to retail for and um, some of the pluses and minuses of them. These are very expensive for patients. Um, as you can see already, we're at 250, we're at 265 and vaporization compared to smoking for some people doesn't produce the same results. So while vaping may be considered safer, it's not always the preferred method for some patients. Um, this device is easy to use. It can heat up the material in about 15 seconds. It's quick, but not the quickest on the market. Um, the battery doesn't last that long. It's good for about one session on a single charge. It has a smaller bowl um, and the device itself is larger and less discreet than other devices. It can work with dry herb and concentrate and is also conduction heating. This is the Firefly 2 Plus, retails for about 250. It heats up the quickest in three to five seconds. It's small, discreet, it's best for flour, and it has conduction heating in it. This is the Da Vinci. It retails at about $199. <clears throat> they claim to have an antimicrobial mouthpiece. Not exactly sure how they do that. Um, it does have a larger bowl and has eight minute session long length. So for some people, they like the fact that um, they can get more out of just one session compared to some of those other vaporizers. This is a tabletop called the Puffco Peak Pro. It's only for concentrates and not for um, <clears throat> flower materials. It is easy to clean, comes with an app and is easy to use and allows for good temperature control. It does have a frequent cleaning schedule suggestion, um, which many people have complained about. Um, and the glass is also fragile, so it can break quite easily. <clears throat> And this is the king of all vaporizers. Many people may have heard of this. This is the Volcano. And this is the Volcano Hybrid. This is one of the first hybrids that we're seeing. It's best for dry herb and concentrate. It has very precise temperature control and heats up quickly. It's not portable. If you haven't seen it used before, it comes with a large bag that the um, vaporization air, <clears throat> heated air fills up and that's what people inhale. $6.99, so you can tell it is not cost-friendly for many, many people. I think the most popular method that's out there, or the most popular vape product that's out there, are vape cartridges or vape pens, also referred to as wax pens. And I'm going to sort of focus on these today because this is where the research really makes us wonder whether these are beneficial, um, are they harmful or are they helpful? So you can see here, these cartridges right here, they're either metal or ceramic. And the oil again is often distilled oil that sits in that cartridge. 
and can sit there for months um, after it's manufactured and sitting on the shelves waiting to be purchased. They can start to leak heavy metals, which I'm gonna talk about here in just a few minutes. Um, it may other, also contain other additives like botanical herbs, um, polyethylene glycol, um, MCT oil, vitamin E acetate. Often <clears throat> they are added in there so that you have um, an improvement in the ability to inhale this thick concentrated oil. So they're trying to help decrease the viscosity so that it's easier to inhale. And I'm going to focus on some of these additives here so we can talk about what some of the risks and concerns are. One of the benefits though, of course, is there's a large variety of cannabinoids to choose from for patients. Um, often they will be chemovar or strain specific. And you'll see here that they come with these rechargeable pens. So these products are very discreet. They're easy to use, they're portable, they're lightweight. They have terrible temperature control though. When you're looking at the other devices that we talked about, those are true vaporized, vaporization devices. <clears throat> These um, batteries that you can see right here are often made overseas, and we really don't know how well they control the temperature. In fact, I think we could probably say they don't control temperature well, and maybe heating up the material in that cartridge to the point of combustion and completely losing the benefit of vaporization. So what are some of the benefits of vaporization? Well, it's thought to decrease respiratory harms and irritation to the lungs and throats, because again, it is heating that temperature, uh, heating that material at a lower temperature. It works quickly. So usually within five minutes and it's easier to control the dose and the experience. In fact, there's some research out there that suggests that vaping <clears throat> is, has a higher bioavailability than smoking. I found it in one study that said uh, there was about a 90% uh, bioavailability with vaping compared to anywhere from two to 52% with smoking. Uh, many of these devices are portable and can be discrete, and it can be the preferred method for some symptoms that we're trying to manage like severe nausea and vomiting where somebody can't keep anything down, even severe anxiety or pain where they need that really quick relief um, and can't wait for the onset of other methods of administration like um, gummies or tinctures. The risks are there as well. And of course, people think that vaping is safer because it doesn't heat the plant material to the point of combustion. And I will say that we do have good data out there on smoking cannabis. And so far, those studies have not shown any increased risk of lung cancers or head and neck types of cancers really usually found from smoking tobacco. So even though when we smoke cannabis and it heats the plant to the point of combustion and can produce carcinogens and tars, we're not seeing the same kind of effects with cannabis that we do from tobacco. This was a study and sorry, Tim, it came out of University of Michigan <clears throat> back in 2021. They found that vaping cannabis, again, in the, the electronic cannabis cigarettes had a higher association of lung related symptoms, wheezing, whistling, and cough. Now, this was a study that used self-reported symptoms from adolescents from 12 to 17 and not to discredit adolescents, but I don't know how good they were at recall and they didn't analyze the vape product. So they're relying on these uh, young adults to give them their information. They didn't assess for co-use of the cannabis um, and cigarettes or e-cigarettes. So there's definitely risk, and we do see this even with inhalation of smoking, there's an increased risk of uh, inflammation in the lung, there's an increased risk of bron chronic bronchitis, and people can develop a cough. Um, what was also interesting was that CBD with polyethylene glycol is more cytotoxic to the lungs than just poly, uh, uh, pro sorry, propylene glycol, um, and CBD is more cytotoxic to the lungs than just propylene glycol alone. Um, most studies have focused on Delta 9 THC and CBD when they're looking at vaping risks and not other cannabinoids like HHC, Delta 8 THC, CBN, and THCO, which many of those are synthetic cannabinoids. And there's some data to suggest that added botanicals, which we'll see in some of these vape cartridges or vape pens like terpenes are trying to add back in, can also be cytotoxic to the lungs. 
And again, we know in those cartridges, specifically those vaping cartridges, that the heavy metals can leak into the cartridges. And there's definitely data to show that it can increase the risk of lung to toxicity. It's difficult to study vaping, especially in these cartridges, because there's a lack of standard devices and formulations. And uh, poly, um, polyethylene glycol can increase the incidence of asthma. It can lead to increased inflammation in the lungs and chronic bronchitis. And these testing panels may not include um, looking for things like propylene glycol, polyethylene glycol, uh, MCT oil, vitamin E acetate, HHC, and THCO. So just because you don't see it on your CEOA doesn't mean that they tested for it. So we really have to be careful about some of these products. And so why are we talking about the risks of vaping? Well, if you don't remember, or maybe you do remember, back in 2019, we had the Valley breakout, the e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injury. And in 2019, it led to over 2,800 serious lung injuries and 68 deaths. And 82% of the cases were linked to illicit THC vapes that contained vitamin, oh, it's supposed to say E, sorry, vitamin E acetate. Uh, other cannabinoids are also thought to be responsible as well. And what they found when they went back and looked at some of these cases was that legal access to cannabis products decreases the risk of exposure to harmful chemicals and vape products. So again, most of these products were found in the illicit market. And some of the symptoms related to Ivali um, were fever, cough, blood in the sputum, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, shortness of breath, and weight loss. I want to present um, a case study here, a couple case studies, because again, sometimes it feels counterintuitive to recommend inhalation or smoking to a, a patient who may have some symptoms. And sometimes with vaping, these cartridges or pens, which are easiest to access, they're a huge uh, portion of what's available in the market. When you go into these dispensaries, vape pens are everywhere. Um, and so patients typically will try to, you know, use a vape pen before they will actually purchase flour and smoke it, especially in somebody who may be, you know, reticent or new to inhalation. The other thing that I didn't mention <clears throat> back in one of the studies when they, what they did is they looked at these vape cartridges and they tested, um, these vape cartridges at, I think it was three weeks and seven months. There was nothing in between, but what they did is they wanted to see were these cartridges leaking heavy metals in, um, in the oils. And they found, um, you know, they tested it right when they first put it in and the heavy metal levels were within the state limitations at three weeks, there was an increase, but still within the state limitations. And at seven months, the uh, heavy metal levels were, you know, off the charts. They, they weren't going to pass what the state um, considered to be safe. But what was interesting in this study was that they said that even the higher concentrations of heavy metals in these cartridges, that you would have to take 50 puffs hit inhalations a day to reach the levels of heavy metals that are considered to be dangerous by the FDA in some of our um, inhalers that we use for asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So again, I think, you know, we're not really sure the overall risk. There's definitely risk there. And in some cases, the benefit may outweigh the risk. And these are just a couple of <clears throat> cases where it could potentially outweigh the risk. So this is a 65 year old male who had stage four colorectal cancer. He had moderate pain in his rectal area Opioids were helpful, but caused such severe constipation that he would have aggravated rectal pain with the constipation. He wanted to try cannabis to reduce his opioid intake and improve pain relief. He was open to inhalation, but did not want to stink up the house. He had used cannabis in his twenties. It was mostly positive. He'd only inhaled it. He'd never actually ingested it like through a gummy or a brownie. So we decided to try a vape pen. And, um, you know, often I will be very specific about my recommendations for these patients in terms of giving them the chemovar or strain name that I want them to get. 
But again, studies have found that even though that we're labeling these products as Blue Dream or Granddaddy Purple, that there's testing is showing that the terpene profile in these vape pens doesn't match what the flower profile of some of these chemovars would be. Um, in this gentleman's situation, <clears throat> uh, we got two different types of chemovars for him to try in the vape pen. And um, unfortunately, he did not have a good experience. His inhalation uh, with them, he found that he was really disassociated. He felt like he was paranoid. He felt anxious. Um, and so when we checked in and we kind of talked about it, I asked him to, you know, tell me a little bit about, you know, how you use the product. And he said, well, I took these two really big hits. <laughs> so the other thing that we want to be really thoughtful about if our patients are using these vape pens or what are referred to as wax pens is that they can be subtle when you're first inhaling. And so it might be helpful for a new inexperienced user to take a small little puff, maybe count like one, 1,000, hold it for a few seconds and exhale, and then wait five minutes before repeating that. Um, and that's what we did in this situation. And he actually had a much better outcome and was able to control his pain during the day. He continued to use his just one pain pill at night um, and that was a really good balance for him where he felt like his constipation was more controlled and his symptoms were better controlled. <clears throat> and this is a 75 year old female with pancreatic cancer. Um, she was experiencing significant weight loss. She had about a 40 pound weight loss in four months. She had poor appetite since diagnosis and really concerned that she would not be able to gain weight and continue treatment. It was sort of uh, looming over her that if you don't start putting on weight, you're going to be too weak and too thin to continue the chemotherapy. One of her favorite things was to bake, um, particularly pies, and she had not been able to enjoy the food that she made and said that it did not taste well either. Um, so we kind of talked about the research around appetite and cannabinoids, and I said most of it is with inhalation. That's where you'll probably see the best benefit and the quickest benefits. Um, if you're not open to it, we can certainly try an edible, a tincture, a, a gummy, and see if you get good results. But uh, always try to start with inhalation, particularly for appetite and weight loss. So she was open to it. We reviewed the risks and benefits. And after six weeks, um, she was able to gain six pounds and found that food was more pleasurable and report that her appetite improved and she was able to continue her treatments, which were really important to her um, to be able to uh, try to control her disease. So again, there are definitely times when vaping may be um, the preferred method or the most um, beneficial method for them. And, you know, if you weigh the benefits and they outweigh the risks and it's a short-term need, often I will make that recommendation. I do always like to monitor my patients for signs of respiratory distress coughing, shortness of breath, wheezing, making sure that they don't have any of those respiratory issues along the way. If they do, I often will have them stop using the vaping or even smoking and see if those symptoms resolve. Um, if a patient's going to use a cartridge, a vape cartridge, I really want them to have it replaced every six months. Uh, sometimes people will come back to me and say, I've had this cartridge here for two years. I'm like, I don't even know what's leaked in there. <laughs> Throw it out and start over, which is hard. Um, because, you know, these products can be expensive <clears throat> and recommend products that are tested and free of additives if we can, right? So in uh, legal markets, there are um, some concerns right now here in California <clears throat> where we do see like live resin um, and added botanicals in these products. And I'm not sure what these added botanicals um, what kind of base they're in or what they're going to do. And we're not testing for those things um, or other synthetic cannabinoids. So I worry about vape cartridges or vape juice or vape liquid that you can purchase online through hemp retailers. Um, because again, we're not really sure what's in them. So my preferred vape cartridge or vape product, if someone's going to use that is actually a rosin where they just press the cannabis flower um, and into a um, concentrate, and there are no additives in that. <clears throat>